time the question can be put on any amendments which may then be moved. To open the debate, I call the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union, Secretary Stephen Barclay. Mr Speaker, on the 29th of January, a majority of honourable and right honourable members told this House and our country that they would support a deal. But this support was conditional, that members were prepared to compromise on issues, but not on the overriding issue of the backstop. The Government's motion today references and confirms this House's support for the motion passed on the 29th of January, as amended by the Honourable Right Honourable Member for Altrincham and Sale West. And my Right Honourable Members, I'll just make a little progress before we uh, get into the interventions. My Right Honourable Friend's amendment, in effect, gives this Government an instruction, which it has taken to our European partners. But this Parliament's mandate must now be given the opportunity to achieve its end and the Prime Minister the chance to do so. So it is clear that the Government's priority is to address the indefinite nature of the backstop, which under Article 50 is legally required to be temporary. And I also want to address the issues of a certain of my honourable and right honourable friends who are concerned as to whether this motion gives credence to the Government taking no deal off the table. I'll have to give way to the honourable gentleman. The, this uh, debate, indeed, dispute about the meaning of the government's motion today. Can he be clear with the House? In the event the European Union does not agree to a deal which is acceptable to this House and government, we still will be leaving on the 29th of March. Well, I'm very happy to give my uh, right to my friend and uh, predecessor in this role that uh, assurance. The uh, position. Uh, of the Cabinet uh, has been agreed in terms of no deal. It was agreed uh, in, the, uh, in response to the Cabinet paper I presented on the 18th of December. Uh, and my right honourable friend, and I come on to this, has repeated on numerous occasions, including again in her statement this week, in terms of her commitment to the time scale. I'll happily give way. Way. He, he's set out why he is observing what the House said in terms of alternative arrangements. Why isn't he also observing and acting on what the House has said in terms of the government ruling out no deal? Well, I mean, the, um, the short answer to that is actually the House has said two different things. It's passed legislation. It's passed legislation that has said, by a big majority on Article 50, uh, which mem- many members on both sides of the House voted for, uh, it passed legislation to say that we're leaving uh, on the 29th of March. It put that date uh, on the face of the bill by a large margin. The House voted also to give the people the decision through the referendum by a large margin. Uh, and the legislation, frankly, takes precedence uh, over that motion. And that, in essence, was the uh, point of order that was raised. I appreciate he's done it at least uh, as an intervention rather than a point of order, but the same point stands. I'll happily give way. Uh, I, I thank my right honourable friend for giving way. In encouraging the Government to keep its nerve during this ne- these negotiations, and whilst accepting that the vast majority, I think, in this place would favour a good deal over no deal, can the uh, Government just confirm, for absolute clarity, that should we not be able to secure a good deal, probably courtesy of intransigence by the EU, (laughs) then we will not only be leaving on the 29th of March, but we'll be leaving on no deal stroke WTO terms. As a former uh, member of the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers, I know my uh, friend knows all about holding his nerve, and he's correct, which is we do as a Parliament need to hold our nerve, and we do need to send a clear signal to those in the European Union with whom we're discussing these issues, who share our desire to have a deal, to deliver on our shared values, to respect the fact that we are trading partners and wish to get on to the future economic partnership uh, and work together. But, but that, that, is, uh, that is the state of people. I'll give way once more to him, but before taking some further interventions. I think we all agree about the importance I think we all agree about the importance of keeping our nerve, and actually by keeping no deal on the table it makes a good deal more likely. But can he answer answer my specific question, and that is that if we don't achieve a good deal, on the 29th of March we won't just be leaving the EU, but we will be leaving on no deal terms. For the avoidance of doubt, Mr Speaker, I'm very happy to confirm that because that is what the legislation says. The only way to avoid no deal, uh, and this is a point that 
uh, the Prime Minister, my right to my friend, has repeatedly said, but it is the point that is backed up in legislation. The only way to avoid no deal is either to secure a deal uh, on the terms that the Prime Minister has set out with the mandate that the House has given her in response to uh, the motion. Um, otherwise, it is to revoke, because the court case says that the only alternative otherwise would be to revoke. Of course, I can wait to the Father of the House in a moment, but the only other option would be to revoke. Uh, and if revoking, that requires one to be unconditional and unequivocal. Of course, I get to the Right, well, uh, right, 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 just moving on to an, an alternative. But, but he's just given, it seems to me, the most stark expression of policy that I've heard the government uh, give so far yeah, yeah, on what will happen yeah, yeah, in yeah, present yeah. negotiations now. Yeah. It has alarming possibilities. I, I mean, he says we're bound by the legislation yes. when we passed Article 50, which indeed we are, but when the House passed that, it was on the assumption that a negotiated deal was going to be arrived at, that. and we're going to leave on. Well, of course it was, and, and, uh, and indeed, at one point, the prime minister was preventing, presenting to this house what she said was the ideal deal to go on to the full negotiations towards the declared government aim of a proper, permanent relationship with the EU in due course. The idea that simply because the Prime Minister is probably going to fail to persuade the other member states to put a time limit on a permanent open border in Europe. We go for the catastrophe of no deal on an arbitrary date on the 29th of March. It's ridiculous. And the government could have a policy of coming back here to defer or revoke Article 50 to put the situation in some order. Well, firstly, uh I don't accept, uh, whilst obviously respecting uh, uh, the considerable experience of the Father of the House, but I don't expect, uh, accept that merely restating what is the legislative position is presenting issues in a stark way. Nor do I accept, uh, and to quote him directly, uh, that the Prime Minister is going to fail. Actually, the Prime Minister is working in the national interest, he's seeking to bring our country together, and he's seeking to draw a deal for our country. A short extension of Article 50 does not take no deal off the table. Well, in a moment, a short extension of Article 50 does not take no deal off the table. It simply prolongs that uncertainty and leaves in place the risk of no deal uh, in a few months' time. I'll give way to the honourable gentleman. Which one of us? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for giving me Secretary of State. Secretary of State, um, the Prime Minister met us in the Boothroyd room before the first vote where she lost by 230. And she said that at that point, if their deal wasn't accepted, it was either no deal or no Brexit. Now, there could have been an amendment down to revoke Article 50 today, but shouldn't the government be moving to that point? Put it to the House. You either have, you either have the Brexit that's going to crash the economy, or we forget this silly game with one letter from the Prime Minister of the European Union and revoke this nonsense. It could be over in an afternoon. Get on with it. Well, I, I, think, I think, Mr Speaker, given the preponderance of the SNP to have independence referendums and then not respect the result, to have a referendum and not respect the result, The one thing, the one thing we can always be sure of on with the SNP is it won't be over in an afternoon. <laughs> I'm grateful to my right honourable friend. Can I say that I very much want to see a deal done? I think it is in the country's interest and it's definitely in the interest of industry. But it is also with wide not, uh, history of seeing how the European Union will change its mind and will come through with fresh negotiations, perhaps at the very last, last minute. Can my right honourable friend tell me how his talks have been going on? And does he get the indication that this is exactly what we should allow the government to do? Well, uh, as is so often the case, Mr Speaker, my right honourable friend reflects a sentiment one hears. Uh, in the country at large, which is the desire for a deal, and that is, as he says, a desire shared by many of those we have been speaking to in the European Union, because they recognise that no deal is in neither side's interest. They recognise that no deal is disruptive, and indeed, I come on in remarks, not just to what the German Chancellor uh, Merkel has said herself in terms of seeking uh, a solution constructively, but also the fact, if one looks at the political situation 
in many of those European countries. The coalition that is in place, again, it is in both sides' interests. To go out, I give way to the member for Belfast North. I'm very grateful to the Secretary of State for, for giving way. And of course, we want to get a, a deal with the European Union, but isn't it the case that if you take no deal off the table, that's the surest way of ensuring the other side dig in on their current uh, position? That's just a fact of life. So those who call for no deal to be taken off the table are actually playing into the hands of the possibility of a no deal. And, and would he also then update the House on his discussions with uh, Irish counterparts, because they play a crucial role and they can't hide behind Brussels, and likewise Brussels can't hide behind Dublin on these issues. My uh, right, honourable friend, is, uh, the right honourable gentleman, is right on both points. I mean, firstly, uh, it is uh, important that we have that on the table as part of that, and indeed the only way to take it off the table is either to have a deal or to revoke Brexit uh, entirely. And he is I'm very, uh, going to come on, if uh, I'll make some progress and come on to those discussions, including the discussion my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, had with the Taoiseach uh, last week and also her visit uh, to uh, Northern Ireland as well, uh, where there is a shared desire because, as he well knows, and uh, indeed the comments from I think the highly respected former Taoiseach Bertie O'Hearn in the House uh, yesterday in evidence to uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman's uh, Select Committee, where he talked about the impact of No Deal from an Irish perspective and the common desire in order to seek uh, uh, ground. But uh, I'll, make some, I'll, make some progress and then I'll make some progress and then happily take some further in, uh, interventions. But I think it's worth just reminding the House, because uh, a number of the interventions have uh, uh, sought to represent the position of the Prime Minister. It's worth reminding the House of what the Prime Minister herself has said. And it is that the Government's position remains the same. The House voted to trigger Article 50. That had a two-year timeline that ends on the 29th of March. We want to leave with a deal. That is what we are working for. That is the government's position, uh, and that has not changed. I'm just going to make a little progress, and then I'll happily take some further interventions. Mr Speaker, this is also uh, an important uh, issue in terms of the position of European leaders, which is that if the EU were to make changes to backstop, whether that would enable a deal to pass. That is why it's important a clear message is sent from this House as part of those negotiations. Colleagues should be in no doubt that the EU will be watching our votes tonight carefully for any sign that our resolve is weakening. We should not give them that excuse not to engage. And indeed, in the discussions we have been having with European leaders, there is a recognition, as the member for Belfast North reflected, on the shared desire to secure a deal because the impact of no deal is asymmetric within the EU27, uh, which is a part of the discussions member states indeed themselves are having with the Commission. Uh, I'll give way to the Honourable Gentleman and then to the Honourable Lady. I thank the Secretary of State for giving way, but given that the European Union is saying that it will not entertain any legal changes to the withdrawal agreement, I share the Secretary of State's desire to get a deal and have made very clear that if it came to it, I would consider supporting the government in a future vote. But what I need to know from the Secretary of State is what compromise is he going to give to this House that better reflects the will of this House rather than simply putting a deal back to us which has already been comprehensively rejected? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, if you forgive me, I am actually going to come on to that exact issue uh, there. But, but he cites uh, at the start of that intervention in terms of the premise that the European position. Uh, as stated, is that there will be no movement. Well, actually, the European Union have also stated that they want to avoid no deal, uh, which is hugely damaging. The European Union have also sent it, uh, stated that they want to be clear what the will of this House is and what it is that is required in order to secure a deal. Well, it is self-evident there is a degree of ambiguity between those positions. Uh, and indeed, I will come on to it, the discussions we have been having with European leaders is absolutely on that issue. Uh, and that is why we need some time in terms of the vote this evening to continue uh, with those discussions. I'll, of course, give way to the Honourable Lady and then to... I'm um. grateful to the Secretary of State because he is being generous with his time. But further to his answer to the Right Honourable Member for Holton Price, is he really saying that if the Government has no deal in place by the end of March, if it has run out of time, 
then it would go ahead with no deal on the 29th of March, even when top police chiefs are saying it will make the country less safe, NHS leaders are saying there will be shortages of medicine. Is he 100 per cent committed to no deal on the 29th of March in those circumstances, or are there any circumstances in which he would extend Article 15? Well, again, what, what I set out was we're 100 per cent committed to the position set out and agreed by the Cabinet. That position was agreed on the 18th of December. Now, what I was drawing the House's attention to is the fact that the motion today does not change that position. And that position is that it is our priority to secure a deal. Uh, I have stated at the bo- dispatch box previously that the best way to mitigate the risk of no deal is to secure a deal. I'll come on to some of the issues in respect of the consequences of no deal. I've been quite clear with some of my colleagues on my own benches that I do view a no deal as disruptive, much more so than some of my honourable and right honourable friends. But our priority is to secure a deal. But the operational principal operational focus, if not, I will remote the principal operational focus, if not, is to prepare for what is the legal position. I'll give away to my registered friend and then I will make some progress. I'm grateful for him uh, giving way. The reality is that the vote against no deal in this House was more convincingly passed, including with cross-party support, than the vote to have the Prime Minister go back and negotiate on alternative arrangements. The government can't simply just pick and choose which votes it wants to support. That is fundamentally wrong and anti-democratic, and it's the totally wrong way to handle such an important issue for this country as Brexit. Does he not see that? Can he not listen to the representatives of communities around this country who are deeply concerned about a no-deal exit and want this House's will to be respected? Well, again, I I very much respect the position of my right honourable friend, and I, I suspect on this we will agree to disagree, which is what I have set out is firstly the position uh, as agreed by Cabinet, secondly what is the legislative position, and thirdly what is the interplay in terms of the motion before the House this evening. Now I absolutely respect the honourable lady in terms of how she cast that vote uh, in that division, but the point is it does not change the stated position of the Government, and that is what I was setting out. Uh, My right honourable friend, who is taking a lot of interventions, but I am looking very closely at this motion, and I support the Prime Minister's deal. I want us to get a deal. But the words here say, support for the approach to leaving the EU expressed by the House on the 29th of January. Two motions carried that night, both of which I supported. I would like to hear from the right honourable gentleman that he gives equal respect to the opinion by that House, for if he fails to do that, it is contemptuous of this House. Well, well, firstly, I um, absolutely respect uh, votes of this House. Indeed, when we had, uh, for example, the humble motion in terms of the Attorney General's legal advice, the... Order, order, order. order. Can I just appeal to the Secretary of State? The Secretary of State, in my experience, is a most courteous individual, and I understand the natural temptation to look in the direction of the person questioning him. But the House wants to be hearing what he says. Please face the House. Secretary of State. I absolutely accept um, your uh, direction, uh, Mr Speaker, on that point. What I was uh, seeking to engage with uh, my right honourable friend uh, in, on the point she's making in terms of respecting the House. Of course we do. That also applied, for example, on uh, votes such as on the Attorney General's uh, legal advice, which was disclosed following a humble uh, address, notwithstanding the precedent that uh, creates for future government. The point I was merely stating, which I thought was a point of fact, is that the legislative position as it currently stands, is that as set out following the vote to trigger Article 50. That is the position. Now, uh, as you uh, say, Mr Speaker, uh, I've taken quite a few interventions. I make a bit of progress, not least because I'm conscious many others will wish to speak. Uh, Mr Speaker, one part of the amendment tabled by my honourable friend, the member for Altrincham uh, and Sale West, was to explore whether technology offered a solution to the backstop. Uh, and I'm grateful to my honourable and right honourable friends who have engaged with this work. 
Following the support of the House for the motion, including that approach, the Prime Minister gave a commitment to engage seriously with the ideas put forward. And I have held a series of detailed meetings doing just that. The political declaration makes explicit that both the EU and the UK agree to exploring alternative arrangements, and I am happy to commit to my honourable and right honourable friends that the Government will take that forward, including both investing civil service resource in exploring its viability and its acceptability to the community as a whole. The possibility of alternative arrangements as envisaged by my honourable friend for Altrincham and Sale West has been reflected in the wording of the political declaration. The document notes that the UK and the EU envisage making use of all available uh, facilitative arrangements and technologies. And it goes further with the political declaration noting that such technology should be considered in developing any alternative arrangements for ensuring the absence of a hard border on the island of Ireland on a permanent footing. I thank my right hand friend for giving way. Will he confirm that uh, using existing techniques and uh, technology that's already been used uh, across the border in Northern Ireland? That actually using those and using those for the future arrangements actually uh, gives a good direction, a good foundation on these alternative arrangements. Well, I mean, uh, I, I do agree because that is actually already agreed uh, by the European Union and the United Kingdom in terms of being reflected in the political declaration itself. Uh, and it is uh, an issue I've been discussing with. Uh, honourable friends and right honourable friends in terms of the Alternative work, uh, Arrangements Working Group. Um, I also, I, as I committed to uh, members of the House, raised this uh, in my discussions uh, earlier in the week with uh, Monsieur Barnier. Uh, but I must be frank also with the House that he was sceptical in terms of the timescales of that, uh, but we are actively discussing with it, and I simply point out that that is already accepted in the political declaration, and we are exploring, following the working group, what can be done in terms of the timescales around that work. I give way to now, uh, for, giving, for giving away. In terms of the alternative arrangements working group and the Malt House compromise that we've all read about, can you tell the House, is that now government policy to take that forward, and will he take a fully worked up proposal to, to the European Union as part of the negotiations? I can confirm to my honourable friend is we have taken it forward to the European Union in that I have raised it with Michel Barnier. Uh, I will be discussing it again with him. He has raised uh, some initial concerns, uh, but we are making that case and discussing it with him. Uh, but it is already accepted by the European Union in terms of the political declaration uh, and the work stream that will flow uh, from that. Of course, I give way. Of course. Uh, I'm very grateful to him for giving way. He, he's just told the House that he has put proposals in his discussion, discussions with Michel Barnier. Can he therefore explain why yesterday Donald Tusk said, and I quote, uh, still waiting for concrete, realistic proposals from London on how to break the Brexit impasse? Well, um, uh, one should, always, one should always be slightly uh, cautious about what is said on Twitter uh, generally, and uh, uh, that, that, uh, that applies even to someone as esteemed uh, as uh, President Tusk. I was simply uh, updating the House uh, in terms of the discussions I have had with uh, Michel Barnier, as my opposite number uh, uh, from the EU Commission side, uh, in terms of following up on what this House agreed, which was that we should explore that, and we have engaged seriously uh, with colleagues on it, and we have raised it uh, with the European Commission. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, let me make some progress. Um, oh, I'm, 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 I'm grateful to my right honourable friend. The task as he set out uh, in terms of the alternatives is large, and the window to deliver it is getting smaller. In the interest of pragmatism, could I just urge my right honourable friend in the front bench? I appreciate we're not going to extend Article 50 for no purpose. But if it all it requires is another three or four weeks' work just to dot the I's and cross the T's, then surely, to goodness, we are not going to bite off our nose to spite our face. Hey, I respect the point that um, 
by a number of raises. But I think what I hear from uh, many, particularly in the business community, is that they don't want more uncertainty. They want to see this move forward. They want to see a deal uh, secured. Uh, my right hon. Friend, the Prime Minister, uh, in terms of the next steps, will be meeting with President Juncker next week, uh, and today conversations are being held by her with other European leaders. In parallel, my right hon. Friend, the Attorney General, is pursuing other avenues for possible legal challenge uh, to the agreement. Uh, my right hon. Friend, the Prime Minister, has also made the wider government position clear to many in the EU as I have to the leader of the European People's Party, the European Parliament's Brexit Coordinator and the EU's Chief Negotiator. In addition, my right and my friend, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster and myself have met a wide range of key European stakeholders. Whilst the EU's public statements have said there will be no reopening of the withdrawal agreement, they have also said, as I pointed out earlier to the uh, right and my gentleman, the member for Belfast North, that they want to avoid no deal they want to reach an agreement. They want an agreement that will support, be supported by this House. Members will also see the comments from leading European figures, such as the German Chancellor, who spoke of her desire for a constructive solution. Uh, and the House needs to give the Prime Minister the time in order to explore that. Uh, of course, give away to the Honourable Lady. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. I'm very grateful indeed to the Brexit Secretary, though he may not be just as grateful to me for taking this intervention. But would the Brexit Secretary confirm that the British Government has absolutely no intention of replacing the backstop, which is absolutely essential for maintaining peace on the island of Ireland, a hard-won peace that we absolutely value in Northern Ireland? So, uh, no, I, I looked at, uh, with interest also at her uh, exchange on the uh, Brexit Select Committee in, in referencing uh, the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and, in particular, the point there around mutual consent and bringing the community uh, with her. And that is a point uh, I think is particularly well made and it is at the forefront of the discussions the Prime Minister is having with the Taoiseach and with European leaders in the context uh, of the, the backstop. <laughs> Most grateful to my rival friend for it. The, the amendment which the House passed, put down my right and my friend at the moment for Autumn Sale West, clearly stated the intention was to replace uh, the backstop with alternative arrangements with the hard border. We've had very, very constructive meetings uh, with the Secretary of State, Mr. Speaker. Could he confirm, therefore, that the Malthouse Compromise is stated government policy and has been put to Monsieur Barnier? and that it now has the full force of the civil service to work it up into legal binding text. I have already confirmed to the House that this issue has been raised with Michel Barney. I have also given a commitment that it will be raised again uh, in our next exchange. I have also given a commitment that civil servants uh, are engaging on these issues, but I have also communicated the fact that the initial response uh, from Michel Barnier was to raise concerns as to the extent of concessions that would be required, but that is part of the discussion we're having. Now, Mr Speaker, I've taken a lot of interventions. I'm conscious that many other members, including uh, my uh, opposite number, will wish uh, to come in, so I will make uh, some progress. Um, it's clear, uh, Mr Speaker, that a workable compromise with the EU on the backstop can secure a substantial uh, and sustainable majority in this House and give the Prime Minister a clear and irrefutable mandate to get a deal over the line. In supporting the Government's motion today, this House can do exactly that. Getting to a compromise is a challenge, but it is not an insurmountable one. It requires the EU and the UK to come together and to find a solution. And it calls for both sides of this House to continue to work hard to find and grow the common ground. And I do believe that is in the interests of many watching these proceedings. As we prepare to exit the European Union, this Government is focused on its most pressing task to deliver a legally binding change to the backstop, and we are committed to delivering on that key demand. Our meeting with the European Ambassadors tomorrow to continue making that case. And my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, is speaking today with a series of European leaders. We are also engaging widely across this House, be that with the Alternative Arrangements Working Group, yesterday with my shadow opposite number, or the 30th of January meeting between the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition. So we have a clear outcome, 
a programme of engagement with European leaders and engagement across this House. Tonight, members need to give the Government time to make good on this work and, as a House, to hold our nerve. To deliver, to deliver a deal that addresses the twin risks of no deal or no Brexit, and also to respect the biggest vote in our democratic history and deliver what people voted for.